Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. And community uh, <coughs> for those of you who are not uh, familiar here. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, Fabio Morreale. Fabio Morreale is a postdoc at the Center for Digital Music at the Queen Mary University of London in the Augmented Instrument Club. And uh, we had the opportunity to invite him uh, as a side event of uh, SIDS, the doctoral symposium that we are going to, to have tomorrow. Um, and he's going to, to give us a talk about a holistic approach to design of digital musical instrument, uh, focusing on the last three works that you have done yeah, yeah. at the uh, primary university. Okay. <laughs> uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming Fabio. Uh, thanks, Al. So, um, yeah, uh, I just start with a little bit of context. Um, I'm going to talk about this uh, project that I did at Queen Mary in these last three years is, since I joined uh, the group. Um, so, I know that maybe not all of you are really familiar with uh, the music technology, I guess. I mean, I was told that we have kind of a diverse background here. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of information to start with of um, what what is the digital musical instrument. Uh, but just to start with, I just tell you that in my in the Center for Digital Music is in the engineering department at Queen Mary. But um, yeah, we let's say we deal with a lot of different issues in music technology from like every computer music basically algorithmic generation means that like. Um, um, like coding a software that automatically composes music to some music information with trivia. But what I'm doing in my lab is not my lab, what's my, uh, the lab that I also belong to is the Augmented Instruments Lab. Basically, we Augmented Instruments means that uh, we design extended version of an existing instrument. So basically, we take an instrument, an existing instrument most of the time, we put stuff on it, and, and we basically assign sources of tweeters and, and things like that, and then we extend the range of what is creatively possible, creatively possible with the instrument. Um, so uh, we uh, have kind of, in these last three years, we had a, kind of an interesting uh, multidisciplinary trajectory, and that's where holistic, uh, in terms of holistic, come from, like, this kind of thing includes a, a, a kind of a, a wide uh, view to the, um, to the discipline. And so this is a little bit of the outline will introduce what is what these musical instruments are and how they differ from traditional instruments that we all know. And then I will present the longevity problem with these musical instruments. I will use probably the acronym DMI. I try not to, but if I say DMI, it means digital musical instrument. And then this, uh, I will talk through three projects and um, one is HCI, human computer interaction, so we, we focus on the problem of longevity from an HCI perspective. And then the other one is uh, from sensory model cognition, and lastly, the last project on post phenomenology. Um, feel free to interrupt me anytime. You can ask questions even during the talk, it's fine. I don't want to uh, lose you just in the first minutes and just you know, have all the time you're puzzled about what I'm saying, so just really feel free to ask me if I'm saying things that don't make sense at all, it's, it's likely, so just tell me. Okay, so, difference between traditional instruments and digital musical instruments. In traditional instruments, I mean everything that we know, so from uh, uh, bass clarinet or violin, piano, guitar, everything. So the way it works is that a musician uh, operates on an instrument, and, and basically the gestures that the musician operates instrument are amplified by the body of the instrument. If you think about the violin, the violin, the, the tiny vibration of the strings are uh, actually um, are amplified by the body of the, of the, of the violin. And uh, so we can say that the control, I use it kind of a, uh, again, human computer interaction terminology here, the control is co-located in where the sound is, is generated. So the control is your fingers or your mouth or whatever you use to control the instrument is on the same physical and the same object than the one that uh, produces the, the music. What happens in this musical instrument is that this is not necessarily the case. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. So we can say that the control interface and the sound generator are separated. And we have to define a mapping strategy in which we transform 
what the gestures are into some sample we define. For instance, if I have a mobile, I can say, okay, I made a new instrument with my mobile. When I wave this, wave this mobile, I'm not moving in this direction, for instance, the volume increases. This is the control interface. The sound generator can be anywhere, and the mapping means, okay, as I move this on this direction, I increase the volume, for instance, and as I move in this direction, I, I change the timber. So that's the biggest difference. Um, i just show you a few examples of some of the relatively successful, um, relatively, uh, that's, I'm going to tell you in a moment why. These are musical instruments, most of them are commercially available. This, the Rhodes Keyboard, is a London based company. You can see this uh, is very much inspired by a keyboard, and this familiarity is something that we go through again later in the project. The rack table is um, another digital musical instrument that was uh, created more than 10 years ago in Barcelona by the Pompeo Fabri University. It's more a collaborative musical interface where you position blocks and you can, uh, each block has a specific function, some of them are sound sources, some of them are filters. Yeah, and again, can be used by more people to do this. They are mostly using uh, electronic music context, I guess, experimental. Um, let's see something. This is the oval. It's a kind of a relatively uh, new instrument. It's an extended version. What is the name of this instrument again? You know? Hand drum. Of the name drum. So the idea is here is that um, there are a lot of these instruments that are created every year, um, and especially from, from by Kickstarter, that is this crowdsourcing platform that kind of revolutionized a little bit the, the production process of instruments. Uh, every year, like lots of instruments are created, but I think that is very uncommon for somebody to mention these instruments or, or to know about these instruments if you're not familiar, if you know within this community. Um, and that is the, what we call the problem of instrument longevity. So many new digital musical instruments are invented every year, but really none of them really goes mainstream easily. And there is this quote from uh, Sergio Jordari, one of the inventors of the Red Table, actually, from Barcelona. It says that many new instruments have been invented, but too little striking music is being made with them. And that was 2004. And, and since then, actually, even m many more instruments have been created, but uh, but again, very few of them managed to to be successfully um, to have a successful commercial interest. That's not the only thing. I mean, we don't just judge uh, a, su a success of an instrument depending on how many units it sells, because it can be. Sometimes it happens, like uh, Leticia Sonami is one. Uh, she created a, her own um, augmented gloves as a musical instrument, and she just keeps performing with it since 20 years or more. So, of course, that's an example of successful, even if it's not commercially available. So as a researcher in uh, human-computer interaction and music technology, I'm very interested to understand what are the reasons for this limited success. And so in the last few years, I've studied this longevity and the life cycle of new musical instruments. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. There's just uh, a few of them. It's not just technical. Most of the time, it's, it seems that they say, oh, it's no, maybe the technology is not just there. There are a lot of reasons besides that. Cultural factors, for instance, that there is a limited repertoire available. So when you when you decide to play this instrument, you don't really say, oh, I want to play the eigenharp like 
somebody because it's not something that is already available. Now, when you start, when you're a teenager, you start playing the guitar. You say, no, you want to play like I say, oh yeah, you want to be like Jimi Hendrix or uh, Pierre Kamet in my case. But um, you know, it's difficult if you don't have reference points, like really cultural references, uh, to to really pick up an instrument and, and spend all these hours that you have to to dedicate to learn a new instrument. Other technical factors um, comes into play. Like sometimes uh, new, new instruments seem to be oversimplified in the sense they say that's a little bit next point. Every, everybody wants to make music. Everybody can make music now. I made this great new instrument where you touch and it makes a sound. Okay, thanks. But is it really what people want? So is it oversimplifying music in this way, something that is giving pleasurable and creative experiences to musicians? No, I think. I don't have, I mean, that's just my supposition, but it seems that everybody is going that direction. Let's make music making simple, so everybody want, finally can, can express their creativity. Like if somebody had a lot of creativity that I can express, and finally with these instruments they are able to. Anyway, there is a lot of motivation um, that can uh, uh, underline this problem of instrument longevity. On an academic point of view, there is a few attempts that has been made by creating some design frameworks Design frameworks are like theoretical, um, trying to define a, a theoretical understanding of a, of, a, of a design space. And I also did some, a design framework actually in, um, in 2014, but um, still the problem is not solved. And it is the only way that our community has been addressing this issue. Uh, so, the first thing that I did a couple of years ago, I, I, that's the, from AIDS perspective, so that's the, kind of the first part. I, I focus on 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 on, again, on on design issues. What I did is I conducted a survey, so a questionnaire with the designers of new music instruments, and I and I asked them to tell me about well, first of all, how it went. Is that true that their instrument was not really well received by the audience? And second of all, to reflect on on what happened in terms of things that they would have done better and, and things that they liked. And so, and these reflections of them, we elaborate into practical design considerations using the theory uh, from human computer interaction. And the idea is that we can, we highlighted some factors that future designers of instruments can use to make the design more enduring and, and avoid mistakes. The first thing, again, I asked them if actually it was the case that the instrument was not used so much. And I had a, a lot of uh, questions about it, is that very well it's, who are interesting examples, to so just one out of four instruments of all the, uh, I think it was 77 designers that I contacted, just one out of four were played in a public performance. So if you find all the time that somebody has to spend to create a new instrument, and just have one at most public performance, kind of, it gives a little bit of an idea already. And also that um, the unit sold is, is, is 20%, so, and most of them, uh, this is just including those whose objective was to create a commercial product, because none of them, not all of them are. And so we asked them to tell us more, so what worked, what did not work, and, and this is kind of a little bit um, some, yeah, uh, design factors, design recommendation that we evidence, we need some uh, qualitative analysis. For instance, uh, something important is the presence of signature features, something that stands. So creating an instrument that is its own character that is different from, um, from everything else that is available. Or um, I, I highlighted this familiarity one, and we'll see why um, in a few minutes. For instance, this one was an augmented microphone. And this is uh, all these italics one, comments that I collected directly from people, <coughs> just quotes. So um, these designers said that the concept, how it worked, because it took a form factor that people were familiar with and expanded upon it. There are more um, technological-oriented uh, um, suggestions, like make something that is portable, that you don't need an external computer to run, that's kind of a bit uh, common sense, or use some open source technology as opposed to um, closed softwares. And also um, more on the design process, so using participatory design, user-centered design, actually involving the users in the process of, of, of the design uh, to avoid creating something that eventually people will not use. Um, so for instance, this uh, designer created a, a wind instrument, but he said, I'm not a wind player, I need to gather more feedback about the ergonomics of the instrument and the needs of the player, so in the success and iterations of the instrument, he actually involved. 
between players. Um, so this was presented last year at, at nine. There is a new interface for musical expression. It's a conference, and at the end of the talk, um, a few people uh, said, "Yeah, that's, that's that's interesting, but why didn't you ask to the performers of instruments? Why? I mean, the problem of instrument longevity probably has to do also with not just the designers of the instrument, but the placing." And that's what we did last year. So we actually this year we did another survey. This time we asked performers instead of the designers of the instrument. And well, for the sake of this part, for this of this talk, I'm just going to talk about uh, the specific part of the survey, in which um, we investigated basically. So why do these digital musical instruments player picked up an instrument and decided to? To, to play it. So what are the reasons for existence? Because, again, we want to understand why other people don't do it. So a good approach is to see why do people do it in the first place, and try to see if we can expand that and make more general cases. Again, there is a, we elaborate on the comments and, and things like that. There is a, we have a lot of interesting comments. You're very welcome to, to have a look at the paper if, you, if you're interested. But for instance, um, um, these performers said that Ambiguous device is the name of the device, allowing to explore the chamber material in different form of collaborative improvisation. So having an exploratory instrument was one of the main cases. Another thing that I evidenced here is the extending control. So this was the leading string, is a is a sort of an augmented keyboard. Uh, and and he said with leading strings I can take advantage of piano playing technique while offering enhanced timbral qualities and control. And as such, it's very rewarding for parents to play. And this is one of the main reasons. So basically, before I was saying familiarity, and now it's saying extending control. So basically, if you give musicians some instrument that they can actually control, they have the ability to more or less how you understand how it works, is, is a Again, it's quite common sense, but they don't have to spend thousands of hours relearning a new instrument. You know, it's, it's quantified that somebody has to play around 8,000 hours to be able to be a little bit proficient with the instrument. If you try to, to take up that initial step and design something that's familiar for them, it's, it's, very, it's probably the right approach. So what we did is that we asked ourselves, okay, so how can we actually design an instrument to repurpose the expertise of somebody, so to reuse your ability to interact with an instrument, but offering you another instrument with new creative possibilities, etc. And that's, you know, it was a completely different literature, a completely different discipline, because that's uh, sensory motor cognition. And we spent kind of a, a year or so understanding neuroscience about um, sensory motor memory, how you become uh, expert in, in playing something. And that's the second part. So the idea is that. Um, Expert performers has the, uh, have the ability to automate operation on the instrument. So while you play an instrument, you don't actually think, oh, wait, I have to put my finger on this, on this string and then to strum in this way. That's completely automated. So that is about uh, the sensory motor uh, mechanisms. Feed back and forward a little bit, uh, two mechanisms. Basically, feed, feed forward means that before uh, it's a sensory motor mechanism, that basically um, you can predict the changes in the state of the body before you actually uh, hear the, um, the feedback because otherwise you play all the time out of tune notes and then be able to correct it but of course we know that's not the case a musician knows where to put the finger before he actually uh, hears what he's doing and then maybe correct a little bit but uh, anyway, the, um, the idea is that okay good, there are these sensory motor mechanisms but how strong are these mechanisms? If we want to reuse this mechanism for new instrument, to what extent can we actually alter the structure of the instrument before uh, this mechanism disappear? So if I, I don't know, I give Raul that is a piano player, a piano that is a little bit different, how, how different can it be before it's no longer able to, to play it? That's a little bit the idea. So how sensory model predictions survive instrument modification? And this is the problem of transparency that actually works talking about last night in front of a potion. <coughs> um, so very good. transparency in this context is, I just read this definition, it's not really a definition, but anyway, after years of practice, a tool or an instrument becomes perceptually and functionally transparent to musicians. I was talking before about 
you not actually consciously thinking about the instrument you're playing, but it's like kind of becomes an extension of your body. You can control it as you are controlling your finger uh, when you when you when you operate the wall. And it is that is the question is is there there is it exist does it exist a transparency bandwidth an amount by which an instrument can be altered before its transparency to the performer breaks down. So can we modify and to what extent an instrument before a person is no longer able to play it fluently? And then we designed this uh, experimental study with uh, violinists. We had seven violinists, expert violin players, and we had four violinists. So the first one is that the, they came to the lab. We asked them to bring home their own violin, the personal violin. Then we gave them a very cheap, um, um, very low quality violin. A small violin is uh, a small violin is like 70% uh, of the normal size. Is the violin that usually you play when you are six or seven. And a reverse violin means that basically we flip the strings. So yeah, just in, in, flip the strings. So there's like alteration in the size mostly and the axis inversion. And again, in literature is one of these um, transfer of learning that is used. So axis inversion and scaling. The other one was basically a control. Uh, the first two are control um, conditions. We asked them to play a few things, so as technically that is not very important, uh, but basically some scales, some pieces of a repertoire, everybody had to play this Corante for Bach, and also they could um, play any repertoire piece they wanted. And the nice that we did a lot of things, it took almost two years to, to write this paper, it's still not there actually, we have no reference to this in the even sent to any intoner. Um, so a nice of intonation, uh, well we're going to go through this anyway in a moment. I just want to show you a little bit how it works. So this is the same performer playing his Bach piece and this is how she plays uh, with her personal violin. tracking the position of all the zones and on the violin and on the bow to do some analysis. Let's see the small one. So the fact is the distance is much closer so even small mistakes are not forgiven in this condition. Of course the most disruptive one I should have asked you. But anyway, it's the reverse violin. So flip the strings. We paid them, but we came not to respect them. Is that the first time she tried the reverse violin? No, no, no. no How many no. times did she? Yeah, um, there's a learning effect. So right? that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the first time was the, she started with the scale, so everybody in the procedure was oh, yes, always okay. more or less the piece. So first okay. the scale, and then uh, arpeggios, and then the Bach piece. And the order was always personal, cheap, small, reversed, actually. The order in which they played the violins. They didn't know what violin was going to be next. We didn't tell them. How much time before you told them that they were asked to perform back? Just ah, uh, we gave them, we sent them the, the, the score one week before they had to 
to practice this. But it's, I mean, it's quite easy for a professional musician to play this piece. Yeah, but it's, if it's still on the first side, you can actually... It's not, it's not the first side. They also have first side readings, so they have to pieces that I've never seen before to try that. But then, uh, uh, well, I'm kind of running out of time away, but uh, I'm trying to pick up. Uh, we ask them also to play, they said re reversed, basically, to ignore what was what they were hearing with the last violin, they say, okay, just play as you would play a normal violin. Basically, not listening to what you're doing. And that's actually quite interesting. It sounds terrible. It's quite fluent. It's, it doesn't sound well because, of course, it's not a right note, but it's, it's quite fluent. Anyway, um, yeah, we did some analysis. First of all, the, um, the intonation. Uh, we analyzed each note. We analyzed um, the scale for the intonation, and and this is basically the four violins and the initial phase of the note, the final phase, so before they shift to the next one and the average. And you can see that the initial, uh, so the feed forward mechanism was very. Uh, disrupted for both altered conditions, for the small and the reversed one. But once the feedback arrived, actually most of the violins were able, even with the reverse and the small one, to correct quickly the position. And this actually confirms the, the, the presence of this uh, predictive mechanism that first puts your, like, your body in a certain position and then adapts it. Wait, so what are the three, what's final and what's average? So final, uh, initially it's the first, the first uh, few milliseconds in which they are playing not. And then uh, final is the very last moment before the shift to the next note, and average is all everything that is in between average. Um, so it seems that existing sensory model predictions cannot compensate for the difference in scale and, and scale limitation. <coughs> this is for each participant, each of the seven participants, the same graph. What is interesting here is that they had very different experiences. Let's see this one, and the seventh participant, how she struggled with the reverse one, but not much with the small one, whereas, for instance, this person really struggled with the small one, and, and, and stuff like that. It's just, again, the adaptation was very personal. Uh, Bowie errors, we computed, uh, well, we did a quality analysis to see when they actually performed errors. I'm just going to skip this because I don't have much time, so I can go back if you want. The gestures also, uh, the gestures we computed by uh, computing the angle of the bow with respect to the plane of the violin with, uh, with the motion capture data. And this is a histogram for a single person. So um, basically the angles, as one can expect, they are centered on the four strings. But with the reverse one, uh, having a wider peak means that they kind of had to adapt more the movement of their hand. And again, it's quite expected that was our hypothesis and was confirmed. So I'm just going quite quickly through this. A lot of graphs. Um, we performed statistical investigation here, and, uh, and the main effect of the instrument was statistically significant on the peak height, so in the first one, but not on the width. So the reverse line is the kind of the um, teal um, line. You can see that it's lower, so the peaks, these peaks are lower, so it's less accurate basically the position. I know I'm seeing a lot of things on the topic. Anyway, um, these are a little bit the results. So instrument operation actually <coughs> affect transparency. The fluency of the performance is affected by axis inversion, so with the reverse violin, but not by instrument size. So they were fluent even when playing the little, the tiny violin. However, the intonation, as you heard probably, is affected by both um, alteration. The adaptation is highly personal. That's an important thing. It is important when you design an instrument. So you have to take into account that each individual has different capability to adapt to a new instrument. The third thing is that the musicians compensate for this sensory motor disruption. That's quite interesting. So even if it was not actually, they, they were able to reroute somehow their, uh, their um, learned sensory motor mechanism and find different ways of playing the violin when their existing uh, sensory motor memory was somehow uh, disrupted. And so even if the instrument was no longer transparent to them, they were able to achieve something musically interesting. And actually, around the time that we were finishing this study, we, uh, we had this uh, encounter with another, uh, another field uh, when we were studying uh, the transparency of technology. So we, 
we learned that there's another discipline, that's where the holistic approach comes from. Uh, another discipline that really talks a lot about transparency and embodiment and extension of the body, and is post-phenomenology. Completely different in, in discipline, completely different literature, is a philosophy. So we're going from you know, kind of design to uh, cognition to philosophy. Post-phenomenology is a philosophy of technology. If you have a couple of, word, of, of references here, <coughs> In fact, like kind of theorized at the end of last year, uh, of the um, 20th century by Don Eiger and Wierbeck. And it's focused on understanding how technology mediates human world relations. So, concern how technology shapes the human experience. And so, basically, um, one of the, the most important things is that these philosophers theorize ways in which human and technology, um, the relation between human and technology, divided into five big uh, different relations. Um, I'm trying to be quite quick. Embodiment is exactly what I was talking about before with, with the transparency. That's why we, we encounter this thing. And when you have an embodied relation with the technology, it means that it's basically an extension of your body. And, um, you know, it produces a, a, tr um, a transformation of your perception and action in the world in a way you don't realize. The typical, typical example that the philosophers make is the, is the eyeglasses. So it's a technology. I mean, it's not an IT technology, but it's a technology. And you know, you're not actually consciously paying attention to the technology. It's just enhancing your capability of perceiving the world. So it's part of your body that is extending, and you don't put conscious attention on that. It's a large example. It's like the stick for a, for a for a per that a person uses to walk, for instance, something like that. Again, there are many other. Hermeneutic, for instance, is um, hermeneutic is um, um, it, well. Actually, I just read a <laughs> definition of it here. So, um, a hermeneutic technology offers reading of the word that a user has to interpret. Hermeneutic means interpretation. For instance, a thermometer. When you read a thermometer, you're not actually experiencing the temperature in your body, especially if you watch on your mobile what's the temperature in, in Rome. You are not experiencing it. You, have, you are interpreting what the technology is saying, it's telling you, to infer, like, um, like the determinacy, what it refers, what the technology refers to. The other is quite quickly, um, I actually am not going quickly through it, I'm just keeping them because otherwise I have no time to, to tell you about what I want to tell you. Um, so, post phenomenology lately has been already adopted in ACI, so I didn't have to make a case why is it important for me to send this paper to Kai this year. Um, especially in the sense of post phenomenology called inquiry. So, an inquiry is basically um, an analysis, and, and these uh, researches in human computer interaction suggest that post phenomenology can be a good uh, methodology to build new knowledge on design artifacts. And rather than analyzing a new technology in terms of existing theories, post-phenomenology investigates how the technology establishes new relations between human and the world to form a board that is from knowledge development. Um, and so why is this important for our investigation? So we argue that uh, um, this kind of inquiry can offer some uh, analytical and theoretical tools to frame this complex experience of, of, humans in, uh, of musicians interacting with us. With, a, with an instrument. And we did something a little bit like the violin. So what we did, we modified an existing instrument, but we wanted to disrupt the embodiment that, that musician had, it's not exactly like before with the violin, but this time, we also wanted to reconstruct new relations. So we didn't just want to take off, but also to add new, uh, new, new creative possibilities to reconstruct new uh, relations. And we created this thing, it's the map peak, actually the peak is this, everything else is, is uh, ancillary devices. The map peak is an augmented guitar peak. So the guitar peak is one of the most typical things that a guitarist doesn't think about when he's playing. Right? You don't think, oh, I put the, play in the, the peak in this way. So actually, what we did is we, we disrupted and then recreated um, the conditions of embodiment of guitarists with a peak. Um, how does it work? It's a, I designed this, this peak. Um, basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a hollowed, it's a, composed of two parts. It's a hollowed peak with a, with, a, with a cape on top of it. 
and inside the halo there is a, um, a coil of just magnet of just copper, just wires, very very low technology. It's a wire, uh, and when you basically when you I don't know if you're aware, but uh, on an electric guitar, you have two series of magnets that are the guitar pickups. That is basically what is like creating the, the, the what is transforming the vibration of the strings into electric signal. So the, the, the thing is that we already have magnets on every electric guitar. For the Faraday's law, when you wave a conductive material on top of a magnetic field, there is a current that is created. So every time, our guitar is, is interacting on top of the guitar. There is a little, little tiny current that is created there. We amplify the current with a preamp that has to be positioned very close to, this, um, to the pickup, otherwise you, you, there is too much noise. It amplifies the signal and then it goes into this beta. But it's a mini computer basically. It's a tiny computer um, that combines this signal coming from the pick with uh, with the normal sound of the guitar, and so in this way, we created a number of sound conditions. Combine the sound, the signal that arises from a pick, and the signal that is normally created by the guitar, in a way that the guitarist gestures not only uh, create a sound in the moment in which you actually strum the string, but also in all the moments in which, in which you interact with the magnetic field. So basically, above the string. If you wave above the string, there's still some signal that is created. And it is, again, it was quite interesting to see how guitars would make sense of it. So we created some relatively nice um, artifacts. That's just, there's the, the wrist box, they put it here with the, with the amplifier. The last thing is, um, uh, is, a, is a kind of a pedal that contains the little uh, computer with this cable that comes from, from, the, from the wrist box. And one, comes from the guitar and the other goes to the amp. We created a number of different uh, picks with uh, 3D printing, so with different materials. And we gave them, like literally the, the day after we finished developing this, guitarists arrived because we were really rushing for uh, finishing the sign because we wanted to write the paper. Okay. And, and basically we gave them to 11 guitarists. They took it on with them, this pick, this kit, for five days. And, uh, and every morning I sent them a message telling them something that I was expecting them to do. So I asked them for instance to, to compose a piece with a, with, a, with a pick and to send me a video and also to send me a notation of, of the piece because I was interested in understanding again what kind of relations these things, this new pick was constructing. I didn't tell you anything about the sound design, so how did I combine the sound of the, the signal that comes from the peak with the guitar sound. And again, we didn't spend too much time doing that because we didn't have time, but ideally you can do everything you want. You can combine them in all sorts of different ways. And one of the easiest things, actually, is we just multiply the signals. We multiply the, the signal that comes from the peak with a with guitar signal in a way that um, when you're strumming away from the, from the pickups, there is no sound that is created because if you multiply something for zero because the peak, up, the, the peak is away from the magnets, the sound is null. When you are way, when you are um, you know um, waving, peak is strumming on the strings, that is where you have the effect. But also there is a lot of side effects that are very interesting, and, and this is one of the one that I like the most is an Iranian guy. It's not touching the string. It's hammering on with the left hand, and it's controlling the sustain basically all with the pick. So the distance in the magnets basically the closer you are, the more intense is the signal. But not just that, because it's, if you stay still, there is no sudden signal is created because you have to disrupt the magnetic field. Let's say interact with it.
So it's very, very subtle, the, 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 the interaction. You can really feel very subtle movement. In this case, um, we took the, the sound of the guitar as it normally is, and then we added another sound that was basically a, a, a sort of a reverse delay of the guitar. That, depending on how uh, they interact with the, with the field, is much easier if I show it to you. them to send a notation that describe their interaction in any way they want. They could send out, you know, because how do you describe this new thing? And they could send out everything they wanted and, and that's something that we received them. So um, they we could say also drawings if you want. And you know this lady really um, is quite clear where their intention is and then they use this as a as a probe to ask them to reflect on how their experience went. And she said that she was actually consciously listening to what the pig was doing, that's why the ear and the hand is so big. In this other case, this guy made a normal um, a score. Uh, that's very old because it's a, it's a nice string guitar. And it just, all the, the red thing is the waving of, of the hand. And I wanted to see this. And some people actually didn't do anything about uh, the new features of the, of the, of the pig. So even if they used it to compose a piece, they did not take at all. So it means that for some of them it was not really central for the experience. We did an, um, they came back the fifth day, we interviewed them, uh, we tried to understand a little bit more of what kind of, of these relations that I, that I showed before they, they kind of had, and we performed some qualitative analysis and we saw more or less uh, all these uh, relations to emerge. Um, again, I didn't spend too much time describing them, so I don't think it makes too much sense for me now to, uh, to go on this. But anyway, we, we, we had quite interesting results. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's about if I, if I wrap up now, probably. It is, uh, I don't know, 45 minutes. Anyway, yeah, um, we, yeah, if you're interested, we can spend a little bit more time on, on telling you what kind of relationship we develop. But anyway, what, what I think is the important thing here is that we did this work with respectively. It's not that we started this project saying, okay, good, we are starting tackling this from an inside perspective, then we move to sensory model connection, and then to philosophy of technology. It was really, I mean, that now looking back at the end of the experience, I can see that, you know, framing this issue of instrument design, the instrument design longevity issue, from a different discipline was really important to us to understand the complexity of the interaction. And most of the time, I think that we kind of, it's a little bit neglected, this multifaceted aspect. I, it's very rare in the community of musical and instrument design to, to even hear about these uh, kind of uh, knowledge and theories and methods that come from other disciplines. And, um, and I think that's where a little bit I, I, my, my argument here is here, to 
kind of try to embrace a little bit more, having a more realistic approach to the discipline. It's not just about technology center or design center, but really uh, focused and learning from other, and contributing to, to other disciplines as well. And that's it. Thanks. Any comments regarding the guitar pick about instrument and laziness? The fact that they had to tie something around their hand and they had a string coming through their palm and then another string following the arm to the bellyboard into the arm. Yeah, yeah, we did actually. And uh, that's actually very interesting. Um, we didn't make it as a as a purpose decision, design design this design decision to have this invasive thing. Actually we tried to minimize it. But again, it was really, really uh, just a prototype. We might do something more commercial by the moment. Uh, a, a few people were annoyed. Um, and this this uh, cable, um, this cable is actually very heavy. It's more heavy. It's heavier than a jack because there are eight little cables. So that's why I uh, basically it goes up the arm. They close it with a with a normal like like a hairband, and so it's not on the way. A few people, though, really appreciate it. Say that this made them more aware of being of having something new. It's like kind of a cyborg relation, almost, right? Really having something that attracted their attention, and they were actually consciously thinking about it. And that's really important because, again, we are only focused on transparency and making things. Oh, you don't have to pay conscious attention to that. But even having conscious attention, that it was even given, even if not purposely, by the physical presence of the object, was a, an important thing. So Gave very interesting experiences to, to, to the guitarist, but yeah, surely it's, it's, it's actually bulky too. It, it, the pick is fine. The pick is actually quite thick, but it's just because I like big thick picks, and it's just it can be much much thinner. The pick is not a problem at all. This can be minimized a little bit, hopefully wireless, but you lose a lot of latency probably there. You, you mean there is more latency to the wireless? But yeah, we had some comments that, that actually yeah, happen. Yeah. I have a question about uh, so, uh, the relationship between the designer and, um, and the musicians. In this case, uh, you are testing uh, your, your instrument when it was done. And, uh, but what about the relationship that you can uh, um, have? Uh, so first of all, uh, the people that are designing are also musicians. And uh, is it possible to imagine, or maybe there are already examples of uh, uh, designing uh, this kind of instruments together with the musicians? That's really, really interesting, actually, because to start with, we wanted to do a participatory designing exercise with musicians, and we kind of did a pilot study. It was very difficult for us to imagine how to ask if we talk about augmented instruments rather than actually completely new instruments, if you take a violinist and you say, okay, you want a guitarist, let's make the, the example of a guitarist. Okay, what is that you want to have that you don't currently have? That's very, I mean, say nothing. I mean, that's, that it's very difficult. We, we did the same thing for the violinist because it was way before, and we asked them, among, we had a very long interview, and we asked them, so if you had any technology, you know, think about sci fi, any, anything you want, how would you change the violin? They say, oh, it's perfect like this. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I would really like to see some actual good participatory design activity with musicians. It's just that theorizing these things in the abstract, it seems very difficult. I mean, nobody would have come up with, oh yeah, I want something that, that gives me very subtle control. That, so even if we actually study from the technology here, and that's true, and that's something that I don't like, starting from the technology. But, uh, if you, we consider this uh, um, actually a functional prototype, not an actual uh, finished product at all. So we started with wanting to give them a non-functional prototype, so something that didn't work, so they had to maybe vocalize what they wanted to, to how they wanted to play, and then we ended up uh, using this technology. But yeah, um, I am an electric guitar player, and I'm the, the main designer of this thing, so um, yeah, a musician was 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 involved in that in that sense and um, but yeah it um, was not created as a 
product. We didn't want to make a product. Then, when these guys send me the video, I say, maybe we have something interesting here that we should explore more. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, to start with, we really wanted to do a post phenomenological inquiry. We wanted to create an object. There was not a, a, a product that people were going to go out and use, but something to make an investigation and create new knowledge on. There, there are the related uh, kind of mechanisms in, in, in this field, right? Like the ego. Have, have you thought of using that as a control group so some a guitarist could never use the ego and yeah. give them an ego? Or when I say about ego, uh, I mention any other possible alternative which has been used before that's, in tradition or something? That's interesting because almost all guitars talk about the ego, or this 11 one, and half of them say, oh, it's a little bit like a ego, and other people say, this is exactly the opposite of a Ebo. <laughs> a Ebo is basically a device that you put on a string and it keeps vibrating the string, making it, there's this kind of magnetic thing that keeps activating and deactivating the string. And you have this kind of long sus thing like, like if you had a ball for the guitar. But uh, we didn't really want to do a, a really first wave of the HCI control condition study. I mean, we really want to do something more. Uh, okay, we do give you something, you tell us how it works, what experience you have, what kind of thing you can create with that. But yeah, so it doesn't do the same thing as an Evo, that's the thing. Uh, there are other things. Uh, also, many picks, there is something, but all, all the time you have to put something on the guitar. And here we, you don't have to, because you use something that you have for free on the guitar. That's the magnetic field. Yeah. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. So, just in between the violin experiment and the guitar experiment, you yeah. talked about the importance of utilizing instrumentalist gestures that are already there to yeah. minimize the impact on the instrumentalist. And this is very important, it relates a lot to my research. But I noticed that in all the guitar videos, less in the first one, until the last one the most, all of them use extra guitar technique, none of them strums, or play the solo, they all wait. So how did you take that into consideration? Yeah, that's that's actually that's actually interesting because um, they evidence new new gestures. You have to learn new gestures. What is actually again something that was not planned, but it was obvious there, is that they use the same techniques that they used for the guitar, like the, the way the even was not on the strings, it was above the strings, like on top of the strings, without any extra physical contact. But they could even making this uh, this guy could make a hybrid, so plucking and then changing, waving and plucking at the same time, in, in in really within seconds from from when they find out how it worked. So you see that for some reason some of the transparency was still there, or they still it was intuitive enough. But designing for that it was not uh, it was not intended. So um, yeah. So again, we we had a slightly different objective this time. But if you were I think in that case, what is very important is trying to understand what are the unused space of interaction. So if you're playing a, a guitar, you have a lot of gestures that don't actually, uh, um, they are not used to create a sound. They are just there, but you don't make and use them. So what are these gestures that you're using? And then you can extend to create some music material. That is, I think, crucial there. And again, it's something that I don't think is very much investigated and should be, should yeah, it's quite key in this context. That, that's actually good that you went first because <laughs> you know, trying to connect the guitar and the violin and your answer to bring the transparency word back in was precisely <coughs> my question. But but before that, if I can ask two yeah, yeah. to try to address the participatory design question, I think you're right that if you don't give if you give them a blank slate, they're gonna say, well, our existing instrument is fine. And I understand you don't want to start with technology, but you have to see a uh, participatory design exercise with something. Yeah. Right? And so, but what you've given them is a hardware system and this proposed mapping of the amplitude uh, modulation. Yeah. And so obviously they learned to play it with new gestures. You know? uh, but maybe there was, there's an in-between space in a participatory design exercise where you have this really cool hardware with the coil. You have some different possibilities of mappings, you could multiply the uh, amplitude, you could add a, an effect, you could, and guitarists are quite good at repatching their effects boxes or tuning their amplifier to find their new sounds, 
So maybe the, there is a kind of participatory exercise by giving them the, the part of the technology, yeah. but leaving the, the, the other part of the technology yeah, open, you know, this, but like to see it, you know. Yeah, yeah. That, that was actually the idea of Andrew to start with. It's just that, um, yeah, and what is interesting is that once we gave this thing to the guitarist, even if we didn't ask them at the end of the interview anything about that, we didn't, we didn't even care if they liked it or not, because that was not our objective. We knew that, I mean, they could not have liked it, and they stressed the thing. But anyway, what it told a lot of the time, say, you know, it would be nice if you could do this and this. So actually, actively suggesting design modifications, I think, that could be not just the physical, you know, being wireless, they said a lot of time, but, you know, kind of, this was actually a prop for them to reflect on, oh, that's interesting, but maybe not, maybe more sustain, because the sustain really drops very right quickly here. Or like you know, we had a, we had a few suggestions, but I think something in the middle is, is definitely. Oh, oh, so that means sounds like maybe another iteration would have made it a practice. Yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. But I want to come back to this question of uh, transparency, and think that maybe somehow the violin study and the guitar study are not so far apart. In the violin study, you made a perturbation to an existing instrument to take away the transparency. Yeah. And then in the guitar, you made an extension to an instrument. That gave new possibilities, and instantly the guitarists adopted a kind of transparency of the thing. Not all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Some. Of them some. Did. Yeah. 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 Um, and this transparency. Well, we don't have to go to post phenomenology because this is first order phenomenology of Heidegger that uh, Paul Dürer cites yeah. the Zuhanden and Vorhanden. When are you speaking through uh, the object, or when are you addressing? Uh, the object, present the intro, yeah, yeah, present at hand yeah. And, yeah. and ready up, uh, to hand, um, and so there's a that could become a very interesting framework to study musical instrument performance, because that has been studied. Uh, anecdotally, we talk a lot about muscle memory, yeah, and then in cognitive studies, we know that actually the muscle memory anecdote is actually physiologically exists or is true because if, if in a fast piano passage it's known that if you try to uh, read uh, the note and play a fast passage, actually uh, the information transmission time of parsing uh, a written page of notation and having that control uh, uh, translate motor control on a piano, uh, actually you have to know the piece because uh, uh, your, your human bandwidth of information processing is not fast enough to do that. And that's why learning a piece by reading uh, does happen at a different speed than performing uh, the final piece. And so there we're going from that transparency is something that we develop over time. Yeah. Uh, and that muscle development memory might be the way we talk about it in plain language. Uh, but this is the, the, the shift from uh, this um, uh, semantic knowledge, decoding notation, saying what note is that, which note does it go to, what harmony does it fit in, to uh, what, what Francisco Varela calls inactive knowledge, you know, and an embodied knowledge of the, of the world. And, yeah. and, and so this is the theory of inaction, which is, I think, very much at play yeah, in, yeah. In, in all these things. You know? No, it's, it's totally, I mean, it's totally yeah. connected to phenomenology as well. It's, um, it's one of the aspects, the embodiment is really, mm -hmm. of course, come from direct phenomenology. Yeah. The other modes of the, of the relations are a little bit uh, come neglected in yeah. phenomenology of the others. The other the more just, you know, this happens to be in my bag for the airplane, but uh, <laughs> mingled, um, you know, being alive. So, you know, the literature about being in the world yeah, 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 yeah. Is, is all very, very relevant. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's still, you, I think you, you have noticed that in the community, in the nine communities, I mean, people for just sure. keep building instruments. And yes, yes. they just like it like crazy and without really mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. because they I mean it's fine, you don't have to build an instrument because you want to make a you know a contribute with new knowledge. You can first of all you can make an instrument because you're gonna use it. And and that's very very typical in the community. But also there is a lot of things that can be we can we're just you know taking the the, the, the low hanging fruits I think if we if we don't have a, a comprehensive understanding of uh, account of, of, of what this phenomenon is about. Or maybe it doesn't matter at the instrument. The instrument can, can be crappy, but this whole phenomenological approach might be a way to think about how to make a good performance. Yeah. And maybe that then shifts into my area of interest. You know, that it's actually is it the instrument, or you know, is it you know by thinking about these things, you might actually make yourself a better performer. And uh, I have also another question because in one of 
impressing uh, professional musicians, so craft people. Craft, uh, but uh, what about, I'm asking you that uh, without any background in yeah. your in your fix or art. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so what about uh, testing this kind of um, objects uh, in a completely different context from non-musicians or from people that are maybe moving? Because for me, something like that is kind of appealing my, my my interest in dance, so maybe dancers that are not music, not musicians could, uh, because they have a, um, uh, an ability to feel the space and also the rhythm and so on, they could even play with their body in a way establish that. Um, yeah, it, not much I think it's, things, actually, it, it's, work because, it's, uh, is a very so a completely different uh, design space. I think actually um, no, but actually um, Raul and I started from there, from designing musical instruments for non-musicians. That's what we did for for five years uh, when we were in Trento. And and it's, I think there is um, it's, you you don't have the objective of repurposing expertise because they don't have expertise. You have to really build a new interactive metaphor. That's what we were trying to think. So instead of um, yeah, you know, a dancer can convey what the intentionalities, her intentionalities are through their bodies, through the movements, and how can you transform this into a natural music? So that is, you know, kind of creating a, a, again an intermediate layer that understands what intentionalities are and transforms that into music. That's I think that's a, a very different design exercise, and maybe in that case, participatory design can be a little bit more, uh, you know, something that can make sense to start with. Though it really is. Um, I think it's important to understand whether non-musicians actually want to create music and in what way, because that's something that I, I, I mean, my PhD thesis was about it, my PhD thesis, and I, but I never said, oh, do they actually want to create music? So why didn't they create music before if they want to do so? So if somebody wants to make music, you just go to the shop. If you're really motivated, you buy a you know a hundred year, hundred pound. Uh, I think that uh, this thing to have uh, something to play with as we were offering to the musicians something that they could. So you had this object and then they were giving you feedback. So I, when you were asking uh, them uh, out of the blue, okay, what do you want more from your instrument? They were saying, I don't know, for me is enough. So when you have an object that yeah. you can play with, and I think another thing is also repetition. Uh, it could be interesting to repeat and test again and again and again, also in different contexts. Uh, I imagine what you, you do a lot and then see what is happening. Maybe it's adding an object and the space to I think I think that's the, play with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's there is is um there is sure it's like what in I mean now I feel this is like kind of functional prototype, so giving them something that they can actually use and see what their reaction is and maybe say, yeah, maybe change it in using that way. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the, the important thing is to understand what kind of creation they want to have. Because I'm not a musician that wants to have some experience of music making. That's, I really just try to say what they want to do. They want to play music, they want to create music, make music, I really mean just the definition of what they want to do. And also to what extent, if they want to become virtuoso with an instrument, there is no shortcut. You just do as everybody did before. And everything that is that tries to to say, oh no, 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 you can learn my instrument to become amazing virtuoso, and then you can learn the violin. I think that's really fraud, and that's that's very important to kind of to you know um, debunk this thing <laughs> because it, it can be it, it can be quite bad. But uh, but yeah, so what kind of actual experience of music creation do they want to have? They want to have something that because we, we did a, an installation in which they moved, the nomination moved in a room, and by means of by means of their movements they could. Uh, control the emotional music that was created, and that was you know they enjoyed so because they you know they had a different experience. It was not composition, it was not performance, it was something else. So understanding what kind of what level of uh, interaction do you want them to to allow something like that, and and probably participatory design of some sort. Just asking, I don't think is, is successful. So crafting exercises and and. Uh, Priming exercises for trying to, to have these answers is, is really, I, th I think there's a lot of space for, for research there actually. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. 
Yeah. It is really beautiful. I, when I see that, I can imagine like the two islands, like two spots, and there's two people that can communicate with each other, you know, by the voice, you know. And one makes a gesture with the sound and reaches the other person with another language, you know, and that can build something together with the um, with a common language, you know. That expression, that that's um, invisible self-expression of each individual that is here in this uh, room or in this world, you know, can express their way of <coughs> of of they express their words, but in a common way, in the sound. You know? Yeah. And that's I think is really really good. Oh, it's thanks. Really good. I I agree actually. Like find a common language or like sound music so then yeah, it has to be interpreted by the, the receiver of the information right that is that you have to make sure that if you encode your intention your emotion in something you have to be sure that it's recorded by the, the person that receives it even with sound you know but that's yeah that's, that's, thanks for the comment okay. Any more questions I'd like to thank again uh, for being here.